What's good? What's good? We live, bro. What's up, Mario? How are What's you? Happening? I'm blessed, brother. Thank you for having me here. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. No problem, man. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is my first time meeting you, so we virtually meeting. So that's a new way things are going now with all this COVID. It's crazy. But how have you been holding up during the pandemic? Man, it's been, it's been a blessing and a struggle, if I'm being honest. I think anyone who says that they've been just doing great, they, they're lying, or, or they're a little bit abnormal, man. But I think it's definitely been an opportunity for a lot of us to look inward. And if you notice, a lot of the greatest works of art come in times like this. So I expect a lot of great mixtapes to be dropping <laughs> next year and books and whatnot. So, but yeah, man, it's, it's been a struggle, but obviously uh, it's, a, it's an important time for me and what we're about to do in the city. All right, that's great, man. Um, I know we don't have much time. We're gonna spend about 15, maybe 20 minutes max. So we're gonna get right to it. Um, for the and by the by the way, before we get in, you know, I got my people joining as well. Uh, I would love for you to be able to introduce yourself, like who you are, because we're trying to grow your platform as well as a as a as a media figure in New York City. So, oh yes, thank you for that. Uh, hold on just a second. I just want to pin this uh, one comment here. Okay. All right, there we go. All right, so myself, I'm Tion Bacotti. I'm the CEO and the founder of Diamond Cut LLC. As Mario just said, we're an emerging New York City platform, not a hip-hop blog, not an R&B blog. We're a media platform. You can hit the link in our bio. Check out our website. We cover more than music. We're covering books. We're covering uh, community activity. And we're covering our culture, Black culture specifically, and putting all the great things that young Black people are doing in the spotlight. So that's the purpose of my platform. And that's why we have Mario here today, a young Black man who's doing some amazing things in Harlem, New York. So let's get straight to it, Mario. Uh, for our viewers who are watching, um, they may not know who you are. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the position you're running for? Most definitely. Uh, again, everyone, it's great to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mario Rosser. Um, my mom gave me the name Mario, which means warrior. It's from ancient Rome. At the end of the day, uh, that's who I am. I'm a fighter. I'm an advocate for those in our community who have not been prioritized and expanding access to opportunity for those who have not been prioritized. That's the reason why I'm running for city council in the June 2021 Democratic Party primary. We have the opportunity to move forward in our city. We have the opportunity to focus on rebuilding the economy in a way that actually includes the most underserved communities for the first time. We have an opportunity to focus on reimagining our approach to public safety in a way that acknowledges that policing is just a band-aid. And so um, that's who I am. I grew up coming home to eviction notices on my front door. I have friends who I grew up in the sandbox with who are literally sitting in prison right now as we speak. That's who I get up for every day. That's why I'm running. And uh, I, I look forward to, to being able to go through the next eight months and, and, and spreading our meshes throughout the neighborhood. All right, great. Thank you for telling us about yourself. And I know you're not from Harlem, New York originally, correct? That's correct. That's correct. And uh, so where are you from? Yeah, so first of all, I live I live at 135th and 8th. I've okay. lived uptown for my entire adult life okay. uh, since I was 18 years old. But I was born and raised in a city called Toledo, which is about 45 minutes outside of Detroit. And shout out to Detroit because it seems like Detroit might have might have saved democracy uh, today. But yes, yeah, about 45 minutes from Detroit. And... Um, it's place about 35% of the population is black. And uh, my grandfather moved there 50, 60, actually about 75 years ago from Mississippi to escape the anti-black racism of the South, along with the wave of all those black folks who moved out of the South and moved to Chicago, moved to LA, moved to Detroit, moved to Harlem. And so uh, where I'm from, if you were to come there and there's some people who are from there who are on the who are on the line, um, it's it's just like Harlem. There's a saying that 
some community organizers here in Harlem who've been real influential over the past several decades. They say they, they organize and advocate for Harlem and for the Harlems of the world because the reality is we have a shared heritage. Our neighborhoods are not dealing with these issues in a vacuum. We're talking about issues of poverty. We're talking about issues of displacement. We're talking about issues of economic exclusion. And so um, Harlem is my home. I've lived here since I was 18 and I've, I've spent a lot of time doing everything I can to, to make this a better place while I've been here. All right, that's great. And um, I'm glad you said that, what you just said just now about this, uh, the struggle that we face in our, a lot of our inner cities and our black communities, it's not exclusive. Whether you're in Harlem or you're in Toledo or you're in Baltimore or you're in Compton or you're somewhere in the South, you know, it's black people are going through a lot of the same things in the inner city, whether it's the social, socioeconomic struggle, you know, people just being poor and not having access to opportunities. So I'm definitely glad you harped on that. Um, so my second question was, you know, you say you live on 135th and 8th. That's like right in the heart of Central Harlem, which is the district you'll be running running for. So what made you want to run for City Council District 9? And really, what got you into politics? Man, I, I was raised by people who were out on the picket line. I was raised by people who worked in factories and literally built Jeep Wranglers, and they had to fight for fair treatment as workers. I remember some of my earliest memories, honest to God, were of my mom going out, was of my mom going out on the picket line, striking so that they could have safe conditions in their workplace. I think that there are many ways to make a difference. Politics is not the only way, but within me, it has been ingrained to care about collectively how we're doing as a community. That's just the way I was raised. Um, I don't think politics is the only way to make a difference. We have folks like yourself who uh, you, you provide a platform and you ask the tough questions. We have people in the nonprofit space who are focused on uh, providing access that's not access to opportunity that's not necessarily political. And then, yeah, you can get involved in government and run for office. I think it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity to make an impact on our community I believe that the city council has the tangible power to move our community forward, whether we're talking about the way that we design the budget and where the money is going. And, and this year, more, than, more people in our generation than ever are aware of, hey, you know what, that city council seat is important when that vote actually comes down. And so that's just in the, in the midst of the protest that we've been engaged with this summer. But even before that, when we think about where, the, where New York City is right now and where Harlem is, man, people, people, hundreds of people in this neighborhood have died s sooner than they needed to. We have dozens of businesses that aren't necessarily opening back up or, and are struggling, most of them Black-owned businesses. And so the decisions that are made by the city council and the mayor who are, who's going to come into office and be elected next year are going to have a larger than normal impact on the future of the city. I believe that the 2021 municipal elections in New York City, this is the most important city elections since 2001 in the period following September 11th, just because of the issue that the city is facing. And so um, that's why I'm running because typically when you've had crises in New York City, whether we're talking about the period following September 11th, whether we're talking about going back to the period following the war on drugs and the crack era, whether we're talking about the fiscal crisis that the city faced in the late 70s and early 80s when the president of the United States told New York City to drop dead, typically these issues have, and the budget has been balanced on the backs of black and brown communities. Look at what happened in New York City after September 11th. You, you had this revitalization of the economy, but that went hand in hand with widespread gentrification and widespread displacement from 2001 up until today. With this crisis, we're not going to, we're not going to balance this crisis on the black backs of black and brown people. That's why I'm running. Um, because you need voices and, and Harlem, Harlem uh, has to be a strong voice for our community. So that's why I'm running to, to translate the energy of the street 
to actual results in public policy. Great response. I'm glad you spoke on gentrification. We're going to get back on that too because that's also a major issue. Um, as you can see, you know, living in Harlem and seeing it for yourself. Um, so my next question would be, you know, although you're not running until next year, 2021, why have you began campaigning so early? And do you feel like there's any benefit to you starting earlier opposed to next year? Tion, I'm actually going to push back on you on that one, brother. This actually, I'm not even starting early. The way that this system is set up in New York City is set up, is totally oriented for people who are first-time candidates and not necessarily a part of a groomed system of candidates to not be able to be successful. Let me put it this way. In order to even vote in the June 2021 Democratic Party primary, you actually have to be a registered Democratic Party voter. I don't need to preach to you and preach to everyone on here within our community amongst our brothers that people, a lot of people don't want to be Democrats. Right. A lot of people don't want to vote and they're not even registered as Democrats. Maybe we can make the case to if they if they really uh, make the case to register so they know they need to so they know that they can participate in the June 2021 Democratic Party primary. But here's the thing. The deadline to register or change your party affiliation, say you're independent. Is February 15th. If you register as a or change your affiliation from independent to Democrat after February 15th, you can't even vote in the June 2021 Democratic Party primary. The entire system is set up to protect those who have had power for like decades and decades. There's a saying, power is never given. You got to take it. You got to start early. You got to start mobilizing. And the only way we're going to get this done, if we get out there and engage with as many people as possible and just by the virtue of the 160,000 people, the 160,000 people who live in Harlem, we literally have to start right now. We have to start right now. Um, and that's not to mention that February 15th deadline is designed because in order to get on the ballot, you actually have to get at least 500 signatures from registered Democratic voters in this district. So say we make the primary hot people finally paying attention to politics now, all that. Maybe they don't start paying attention to February 16th and they have been independents. It's too late. So we have to start now. So over the next, over the next uh, month, uh, or actually starting, we, we've been already out here heavily, so we're going to continue to escalate it. And, you know, you just taught me something, and I'm, I'm glad you taught, you know, our, our followers and our viewers something as well. I didn't even know um, that if you didn't start at a certain time, you know, um, that you wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, shout out to my uh, people in the comments asking about Cardinal Hayes. I went to high school there. Shout out to my boy, Sean, Will, everybody that joined. But uh, not to get sidetracked, um, my next question, we're going to uh, kind of just have What's a What's up, everyone? Thanks, everyone, for joining. I see some of my people in here, too. Hang, hang in here. Get to know Tion. This is neighborhood media mogul in the making. Yes, yes. So we're, we're going to channels everyone doesn't go to. Uh, Sean asked a question. Before I get into my question, he asked, had you heard about Kristen, who's running as well? And uh, just to elaborate on that, I actually have an interview with Kristen on YouTube. We spoke about two, three weeks ago, and she's also running for the same position you're running for in the same election. So, you know. Well, let me let me speak on that. And, and actually, um, this is another piece of information that people might not be familiar with. This is the first time in New York City elections where you don't just have to choose one candidate. Mm. You can actually rank up to five candidates on the ballot. Why did they do this? You had elections in the past where people were winning without even getting the majority of support of the people who actually live in the neighborhood. They were just targeting one specific thing. And, and typically, when you can just kind of target one specific group and get by that way, you actually are incentivized to do all kinds of negative campaigning and divisive politics that actually doesn't bring everyone who lives in Harlem together. Now, because we have what is called ranked choice voting, the people, the person who's gonna win is the person who can bring everyone in the neighborhood together. Harlem is a very diverse place. You got a lot of different types of people who live in Harlem. Right. If you walk around the neighborhood, it's one of the most diverse in New York City. Obviously, it's a bastion of black culture, 
but you got a lot of different types of black people. You have all the diaspora. What you said your last name is Bakari? Bakodi. Bakodi, where, where are your people from? Um, well, the last name Bakodi, if I'm just being honest, has to come from slavery because I'm not Haitian and it's a French last name. So, but I'm African American. Okay, got you. Well, so am I, but we got we have African people here, we have Dominicans, we have white people, we have all types of people in Harlem. And so with ranked choice voting, the person who can really reach out and bring people together, that's who's gonna win. And so Kristen uh, and I, we do know each other. And you don't necessarily, you know, if you like me and her, you could rank one of us, uh, you know? And so, and that's what, I think that's actually a good thing for the neighborhoods, good for politics. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I wish her all the best. I'm gonna be running a very positive campaign that's focused on my vision, what I'm gonna do. I don't think anybody wants to, wants to hear me uh, tearing anybody else down. And that's not the type of person I am. Oh yes, I'm glad that you said that too because that's very important in our in our community that we don't tear each other down. Although we may be, you know, competing against each other for position, at the end of the day, we're still black people. We all go through the same struggle, so it's important that we don't tear each other down. I love that you, you know, didn't say anything bad about her when I asked you that question. Man, look, this, you know, Harlem is a small neighborhood. You can walk all around Harlem in like 20, 30 minutes and be in every corner of the neighborhood. At the end of the day, man, we're all going to be gone and we're all trying to make the neighborhood a better place. And I, I tell everyone who is running or who I talk to, man, I want to be able to do this. And still after this, we can go to St. Nicholas Park and, and kick it and turn up in summer 2021. It's going to be the best summer of all time. And right. so um, that's 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 what I'm committed to. OK, so um, another question from the comments. So wait, multiple people can rep District 9. You know what? Uh, that is that is not true in the sense of city council, in the sense of local government. You say within local government, and I'm sure a lot of people know, but just in case there are some who don't, you have a city council person who is responsible for representing the neighborhood to city hall, at city hall, and negotiates with the mayor in terms of the city budget. Then you have the state representative who, and, and then you have the state senator who represents Harlem in the state assembly, in the state senate, respectively, at the state level, negotiates with the governor. And then you have the uh, U.S. representative, the congressperson, who represents Harlem to the nation in, in D.C. And so, you know, you can actually, you only have one city council person for District 9, but you do have other people. And it's, it's a team of people working at every level of government. Because there are some things that, as a city council person, if elected, I don't necessarily have the authority to do, and, and even the city doesn't have the authority to, to fix it at that level. For right. example, we're looking at a situation where we have historic budget shortfalls in New York City. And what we actually want to do is be able to borrow some money so that we can keep basic services going for people. That's actually not up to the mayor or the city to do. That's actually Cuomo's decision. Wow. And so we actually have to work the entire Harlem representative delegation across city council, the state assembly, state senate, the Congress person to get stuff done for the people who live here. And at the end of the day, um, man, that's, that's what I do professionally. I work at LinkedIn as a partnerships manager. And so uh, I'm going to bring a very partnership, relationship building oriented approach to to government uh to to represent the neighborhood oh that's that sounds great um a lot of people including myself didn't know you know that people like Cuomo are actually uh, you know in charge of a lot of these decisions and i'm glad that you brought that up you know because ho you know hopefully if you do get elected that you can bring these issues up to cuomo because these are dire issues now next um i want to get into uh just you know three of your agendas and your policies that kind of stood out to me and that I think are like glaring issues that, you know, need to be addressed in Harlem. So the first one I want to talk about is the policy about substance abuse and violence. Now, and how do you plan on resolving that? Now, you live in Harlem. I live in Harlem. You can see it, whether it be, you know, I know you're over central Harlem, but from east to west, we have a problem with substance abuse. A lot of our residents are strung out on drugs, whether it be K2, heroin, whatever it may be. We have a lot of substance abuse issues. This summer has been the most violent summer I can remember. I'm 24 years old. I grew up in Harlem, lived here all my life, that I can remember ever. 
Like it's people have been dying every day, just outside of COVID, just gun violence and, you know, random senseless acts of violence. So what are some ways that you plan on, you know, resolving the drug abuse problem and the violence that's going on in Harlem? So when I'm talking about substance use and when we're talking about violence and gun violence in our community, it's not just a policy issue for me. Um, I was born in 1991, about two weeks after Jordan won his first championship ring. Two years before I was born in October 1989, my mother was in a hospital room with her best friend and she witnessed the birth of my god brother. Mm-hmm. That she saw my god brother come out of his mother. His father wasn't in the hospital. She told me that it was that event, the sobering reality of seeing him being born, that made her decide to stop using crack cocaine. Two years later, I was born. So when we're talking about substance use and people who are dealing with addiction, this isn't something that's like a far issue. I, this is like my family. Right. My God brother, the people who I'm talking about, I have family who, who, are, who are in prison because they've been the shooter. And I have family who, who've been on the other side of the gun. And so, you know, these issues are like very much personal to me. And uh, I never had to read a book or go to a class to understand like what's really going on in our community. What do we do about it? Number one, we need to expand the budget for substance use programs. When we're talking about the city budget and so much has been talked about this year around budget justice, we're not nearly investing as much in services to be able to get people away from addiction as we are in investing in resources to help the police lock up people and criminalize addiction. When I walk down 125th Street, I see the people out there. I see it. And you know what? It's something that we have to continue to work on in our community in terms of getting people the, uh, the access to, to substance recovery programs. But then beyond that, for folks who are born and raised in this community, we have to invest in prevention programs. We have to invest in, in making sure that this is a strong economy. When people have an opportunity to start a business, to, to live prosperous lives, there's no, there's no coincidence that uh, we, we see those types of activities decrease. So, uh, man, I, I look at this from a, a very human perspective because these, this is like my family, like for real. So uh, I, I think those are some things that we're going to do. And I look forward to over the course of this campaign getting even more specific in terms of people who are actually going through these things, what they need in order to go down an alternative path. Because I recognize that um, the violence in our community, the gun violence is, is rooted in a lack of economic opportunity. Totally. Period. You know, and, and I was the only person for my block to make it out and go to college. That, that bothers me every day. And that means they're systemic because there's some smart brothers who grew up on my block. We right. just didn't have the same opportunity. And I was fortunate enough to be able to make it out. And so that's why I'm running to be able to create some opportunity for other folks in the next generation to not have to work as hard as I did just to be where we're at. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you said that. Definitely, uh, definitely systemic. And then the uh, fact that you, you know, that you harped on being the only black or the only person from your block to get a chance to go to college, you know. I was, I'm in a similar situation. Maybe one or two other people from my block had the opportunity to go to college and uh, finish up. But a lot of it is rooted in uh, systemic racism. Like, And um, just to kind of uh, add another layer onto this question, everything you said sounds good. And I'm, I'm sure you'll work your hardest to get it done if elected. But with all the systemic things set in place against people in the inner city, do you think you know, that it is even possible for these things to, you know, come to fruition? Yes. Yes, it's possible. Yes, it's possible. And because at the end of the day, politics is just what we decide to do together, period. 
Politics is what we decide to do together. This year, we have seen the power of our generation to literally go into the streets and get laws changed overnight. And we're looking at state representatives and state senators like, yo, why did y'all wait to the crisis to do this? It's about the pressure. And so when we're talking about this crisis, you never want to let a crisis go to waste. And the crisis is going to continue past next year. And we're facing an economic crisis. And we're still in a public health crisis. And the racial justice crisis hasn't gone anywhere. We need to keep up the energy. We need to keep up the energy that has been in the streets. Keep the pressure throughout this primary election so that we get people in office who actually come together in that assembly in City Hall and have consensus around getting these things done because in politics, anything is possible. It's just about, is there the political will to do it? I personally think, and this is why I'm running, I think right now we have a chance in New York City based on everybody who else who's running for city council, basically you're gonna have a whole new council because a lot of reps who've been in office are term limited. Based on what everyone else is talking about, it's gonna be revolutionary. Most definitely, most definitely. So I'm gonna actually put these two questions together because I know we went a little bit over our time. It's all it's all good, man. I'm I'm enjoying the vibe. Okay, definitely. Um, so the next policy that I want to speak on because I I definitely see it's a glaring issue in Harlem is helping the homelessness. Um, you know, is homelessness is crazy. I specifically myself, I live on the east side of Harlem, and it's it's outrageous here. Like I've never seen this much people homeless without shelter. You know, it's it's heartbreaking too to see it because it's like. You know, as much as you want to help these people, it's like, it's only so much you can do for someone who's homeless, you know, just giving them the money to get food is just a temporary fix. So which, which way do you feel that you can help, you know, the homelessness? You know, man, isn't it ironic that we have more empty apartments in New York City now than we've ever had because so many people have left the city and we have homelessness at record levels? We have record number of empty apartments and we got record number of people sleeping on the streets going into this winter. The homelessness crisis is rooted in our lack of looking at housing as a human right. The homelessness crisis is rooted in the housing crisis in New York City. So I think in order to truly solve the home, and I don't actually even like to use the word homeless, I, is, I actually wanna use the word house because these people got home in them, they just not in the physical house. So let's talk about the houselessness issue. House. It's, it's rooted in us not looking at housing as a human right and us letting capitalism recklessly control the land development and land use process instead of letting the community drive land development. So what do we do about houselessness right now, quite tangibly? I think, so if, if elected, I will, I will build support to increase funding for direct outreach to people along 125th Street, which is a corridor where we're seeing hot spots of that. I, I think we need to have compassionate, more compassionate individuals on the ground, literally engaging people, train people who have compassion though. Um, because I'm, I, I refuse, I'm not gonna sit up here and criminalize homeless, houselessness. I don't think that's right. Um, that's not where my morals and values are um, on, on an issue that we can solve. Beyond that, I think we need to uh, take this opportunity where the city is going through a, a real estate inflection point to reorient, re reorient how we uh, think about land development and affordable housing, which is a whole separate issue. But I'll pause right there. Okay. And uh, I just want to go back to the comment section. Sammy asks, what do you think of what's been done in UWS using Luzerine? I, I hope I pronounced that right, to house people? Man, look, the Upper West Side, not in my backyard. Right. Everyone's, everyone's liberal until it costs them something. Let those, people, let those people stay in that hotel. I don't think it's right what happened, period. All right, so that was the answer. That was the answer for your question, Sammy. Uh, so the next and last policy it's hearts back on the question, the, uh, the statement you made about gentrification. I'm going to speak about affordable housing. So I, I'm a resident of Harlem. You're a resident of Harlem. Gentrification 
it's it's something that's happened and it's something that we have to I guess just live with and grow with but is there any way possibly we can reverse the tide back to you know the people who are actually inhabitants of of this area can afford to live here and raise families here because like you said people are moving out because they can't afford the rent this point bank period and is there any way we can reverse that back to you know black people can afford to live in their own communities yes we can we can make all these decisions we can we can do it number one in terms of affordable housing i think about it in two ways you want to number one protect existing affordable housing and you want to ex you want to create more affo new affordable housing how do we do it in terms of protecting existing affordable housing that is making sure that we are not letting land be rezoned in a way that hikes rent up to the point where people are not able to live there anymore and landlords are free to just increase the rate all crazy. That's a choice. The city council person literally gets to vote on zoning and what has not happened is mobilization of the community to stop some of this rapid development of, of things that if more of the community was involved, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be acceptable. So as a council person, I'm going to make sure we, when, it, when, when something like that comes up, when, it, when a developer is trying to put up something all crazy or rezone uh, some land such that it's not gonna be affordable housing, I wanna make sure that we, we, we bring out the block and, and they know that that is not about to happen. That's gonna be, I'm gonna be that dude. Uh, and it's going to be it's going to be noticeable. Um, number two, in terms of creating new affordable housing, there's a program called the Mandatory Inclusionary Housing Program, where in hot neighborhoods, the idea is that any new developments, you have to man mandate a certain percentage of it be uh, affordable. Um, and thus far, it's been 20 percent. I personally uh, think that it's a in principle, it's a great program. Um, the way that it's been implemented in certain parts of the city actually hasn't been uh, true to the intention of it. The intention is that you kind of have this mixed housing community where people of different incomes are kind of living together. What some developers have done, they've created one building that's basically for rich people, and then they'll just create like this other building that's for all like the low income people, and it just has not worked out. So I think we need to revise that such that like people are in the same building, and I think we need to raise the threshold for uh, the percentage of houses, percentage of apartments that are affordable. And on my, on my website, as you can see, I will, I will vote to raise mandatory inclusionary housing uh, requirements of 40%, beyond 20% where it is today. Okay, definitely, definitely. And for the people who want to uh, check out your website, uh, can you let them know where they can find the link to go to your website? You can find my website at www.marioforharlem.nyc. Again, that's www.marioforharlem.nyc dot nyc go check us out and, and leave a comment on there i'm really open to feedback definitely so this uh this right here you know would be my last question um lastly you know we spoke about a lot of your policies you spoke about your love for harlem things you plan on doing so you know lastly why you know when 2021 comes and it's time for people to uh put that bubble by your name why why should we vote for mario what makes you stand out above you know, the other candidates who are also running for the same position. Now, at the end of the day, being a city council person is about being an effective advocate. It's about, it's about being able to highlight the issues and mobilize people around the issues. That's been my record in my life in terms of advocacy, bringing the community together and highlighting the issue and bringing people out so that we can apply pressure and, act and actually get stuff done. Right now, our generation is, is awake. People are paying attention and we need to keep that energy and make sure we actually get stuff done in, in, on, the, on the local level. Beyond that, when we're talking about what makes me different from other candidates, you know, I'm gonna focus, I'm gonna run a campaign that's very much focused on me and what I can bring to the table but when you've lived through, when you have like lived experience with like issues, you, you kind of bring a different energy to the advocacy. You bring a different energy. When you, when you grew up 
and you know you grew you grew up and your and your mama and your mama used to you know smoke crack before you was born and you grew up in that environment you know you know what issues are facing our community you you feel the substance use epidemic right. when you grew when you grew up on a block and you're one of the few people to go to college you you feel what we're talking about in terms of youth opportunity programs when you when your god brother is on trial for gun violence and people are talking about policing and criminal justice reform and you have people in your family who are behind bars it hits a little bit different right. when you grew up in the late 90s early 2000s in the aftermath of the crack era you really grew up on the block for real it hits a little bit different so when you look at the candidates in the race like i've lived this stuff i'm not talking about it and so um, at the end of the day that's that's what i'm bringing to the table someone who who has who who has lived the issues that we're talking about and i'm going to bring that experience and everybody else on the block to city hall and it's going to be our seat and so um i, I just want to finish by by saying this uh regarding the presidential election today um and i would be remiss not to speak on this for anyone who's on the on the line um we're in a situation where a month ago we had the homegrown domestic extremists trying to kidnap the sitting governor of the state of Michigan. Crazy. We have, it's, cra it's crazy. Like who knows what they were gonna do right. if they had really pulled it off. These people were affiliates of the president of the United States. Um, it looks like Joe Biden is going to squeak by and he's probably going to win this thing. Right. But it's clear that we have a country that faces some serious crises moving forward. And if Joe Biden is elected, the reality is, is that we, as a millennial and Gen Z generation, must remain engaged in order to actualize this change on the local level, because this is a process that goes from top down and from bottom up. Most of the time, the most lasting change is from bottom up. And so I encourage everyone, remain engaged. Let's move forward into 2021, engaged in these local elections when they want us to turn the, turn, turn the channel and just return to the turn up, let's stay plugged in. Our generation as millennials and Generation Z, we've been given a privilege and a rare opportunity as a generation to be of age during a time where we can literally reset how things are running. The last time a generation would have the opportunity like the opportunity that we have was the generation that came with age and fought in World War II. They fought in that war. They were 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. And then they came back and the decisions they made in terms of the world, post-world order that they shaped, sh shaped the world for un un until this day. We are that generation, the millennial generation and the Gen Z generation. Stay engaged. Let's recognize that this is our time. And that's why I'm running for city council. Uh, I need help. Uh, text kickoff to 55444. Again, kickoff to 55444 to learn more about what we're doing as a campaign. And again, check out my website at www.marioforharlem.nyc. We're going to be in Harlem this weekend engaging voters in real life. And so, uh, Tion, thanks for the opportunity, brother. And, um, you know, I I'm looking forward to engaging with you more over the course of this campaign. Yes, definitely. Thank you for uh, dropping all the knowledge and the gems you did on the IG Live today. You know, I learned a lot, and I'm, I'm hoping that our viewers and our watchers learned a lot. But before we get off the live, you know, you're a very smart person. You know, you got a lot of information. I see you got some books behind you. Have you what books are you reading now if you want to, uh, you know, let the people... Oh, man. Uh, shoot. Right. What books am I reading right now? I'm going I'm to be honest with you. Right now, man, I, I read a whole lot of, like, policy memos. Uh, I'm not actively kind of, like, quite reading a, a book right now. Let's see what's behind me, man, in terms of what I really like. Man. 
Okay, I'll I'll go to this one right here. This was one of my favorites. This one uh, is called Reconstruction. It's by Eric Foner, who is a who is a renowned historian over at Columbia, where where I actually went to college. And uh, for for Black Americans, man, not not as much is taught about our history in Reconstruction. You know, my my grandfather, he was born in 1927. In Mississippi, at that time, 60% of the people in that state were black. None of them could vote. In that same state, in the 10-year period following the Civil War, Mississippi sent two black men to the United States Senate who represented that state due to a political bargain that period in that project of Reconstruction ended after 10 years, basically because of a political deal where somebody got the presidency and they agreed to pull troops out of the South. What if they never pulled those troops out of the South and we were, we were allowed to be great down there. What could have happened? That's politics. That's politics. And a lot of people don't know that history of of what we did in that period following the civil war, the public education system was created in that period in order to be able to have capacity for all the free people in, in the South. A lot of institutions that Americans value today came about in the reconstruction period. They don't even really teach it in the schools. It's like one paragraph. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna pause on that, man. There's a lot we can get into up here, but uh, anybody who's on this, man, feel free to, to hit me directly. I'm super approachable. And uh, again, brother, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk. And I look forward to building with you more. Oh yes, most definitely, man. Thank you for joining the live. Uh, you guys make sure you follow Mario learn more about his campaign. If you enjoyed the IG Live tonight, you know, share it with everyone, share it with your friends, follow us. I appreciate you guys joining in, asking questions, and, you know, make sure you gra- you guys grab yourself a book and learn your history and knowledge. You know, excuse my language, but as they say, if you want to hide something from a nigga, put it in the book. <laughs> and, every, and, it's, and our history is in, the, is in these books, and, you know, you know, it's not taught to us. <laughs> a lot of people don't grab books and read, but it's in there. Trust me. Hey, I told I told y'all this was the real podcast. This not the this not this not the soft podcast. Yeah, this is you know I'm here to enlighten my people so we can all learn and grow. So I'm not holding back. <laughs> all right, man. All right. But yeah, have a good one. Thanks for you joining. As well. Everyone, have a good night. Thank you. No doubt. All right.